whoever is listening, guys, welcome back. My name is Grayson Mann. This is the Man with the Plan podcast, episode 83. And joining us yet again is a special guest of the show and a good friend of mine. We talk ball all the time is Jackson Malone, the host of JEM Live. Has o- almost 8,000 subscribers. So if you haven't already, go do so. And over 1.3 million views on his channel he is one of the rising stars in the nfl youtube community and i'm excited to have him on once again to talk some nfl draft how are we doing buddy bro i am so pumped it is that glorious time of year again where we get to watch and you know it kind of gets dry um, <laughs> out of, it kind of gets dry because you know after the nfl draft there's not going to be like too much to talk about um because you know there's like a four month period after the fact but so let's rejoice that draft period all the bad teams in the league gets get pumped about their new players joining their team so i have no idea what we're talking about today so i cannot wait to see what you have in store for us i cannot believe you that was for those who don't know can't see i i'm I'm wearing this Celtics hat that was a mistake as we're recording this they got smacked this afternoon which uh i guess you're taking full advantage of so okay i gotta you just caught me off guard. You're really winning this one early. I got <laughs> what? Do I have okay. something in my teeth? Oh uh, no, it might be it might be something that you're wearing. But all right, hey, let's can get... we tell the Celtics it's not 1985? You can't score 89 points in a basketball and win. <laughs> oh, I didn't think I'd I would escape it, but all right. So, anyways, Jackson, I really want to get your take on something that has really caught the attention of not really the draft scouts or the drafts or anything like that, but I want to talk about the quarterbacks and. It's really funny to me because it's been such a difference from last year. So you have, you had a, the number one pick with Trevor Lawrence, you had Mac Jones, Justin Fields. Last year's draft, you couldn't start a conversation with it without talking about quarterbacks. This year, it is more about everybody else. And it really showed in this year's draft. But I honestly think it kind of worked out in the best way possible. Each single quarterback, I don't think that has to play next year or necessarily will. And they will get that time to develop and really – Take it back to that, like you said, 1985, where rookie quarterbacks were drafted and they didn't really play. They start, they sit, for, sat for a year. They learned how to be a pro. Tell me, where, where did you see like Desmond Ritter with the Falcons, Kenny Pickett being the first quarterback taken, Malik Willis with the Titans? I thought they were all fantastic spots. I really wanted to get your take on it to start with it, just because it really is the least most important conversation of this draft. And I just want to get out of the way. It was actually so fascinating, and I was really, really excited. So me, I'm a Lions fan. A lot of people had Malik Willis going, too, and I was a strong advocate that that was not the right time for that. I did have Kenny Pickett as my first quarterback on my draft that I graded throughout. I think this is a great fit for Pittsburgh, and I know they just paid Trubisky. I would not be surprised if Kenny Pickett's the man pretty soon because I think they said there's not really anyone special in this draft. I thought Kenny Pickett by far was the most impressive to me and every knock he had I really don't see is like a knock it's probably like the same knocks you could give like Joe Burrow like not like the biggest arm it's like okay but if you're making all these throws you're mobile uh you're completing over 70 percent of your passes like you have like the it factor that everyone's saying. So I'm really glad he ended up with Pittsburgh. And that really confirms everything I thought about him because they play in Heinz field. So the Steelers have been able to watch him for five years. And so knowing that he's that guy Malik. So it's really interesting when you said Malik uh, to the Titans and Ritter to the Falcons, really kind of different things because Malik Willis, completely different quarterback than Ryan Tannehill. Marcus Mariota, identical to Desmond Ritter. So I really like, I think Kenny Pickett is probably the most likely to start sometime during this season. Uh, My favorite place that Malik ever could have gone looking on it now is probably the Titans. And for the Falcons, it made a lot of sense because if Mariota gets hurt, uh, we haven't seen him play in a while or he's not playing up to par, then you really don't have to switch your systems up that much. So even it being a really, really interesting draft, I was surprised not where everyone went, but how far back everyone went. So that was probably the most surprising thing to me. Yeah, something that really like caught me off guard was I thought people would, and I did, I was very impressed with the NFL teams. They didn't end up staying at settled. They didn't reach. They really said, hey, we're going to take the best player available. This is not really the draft for first round quarterbacks because we don't know. All three of these guys we just talked about, or even Matt Corral, they could be the face of this new franchise or something like sure. that. So it's really, it was really weird to be like, hey, where's Malik going to go? Because it got to like the third round and I was thinking, man, this is really, this is kind of like a fall, 
maybe Malik makes 31 other teams pay and he is able to team up with Traylon Burks and Derrick Henry, which is weird to say. I was about to say AJ Brown, <laughs> but AJ Brown is a point out. We'll talk <laughs> about that in a second, but I'm really, it was really shocking. And I think you either were going to be on the team that you bought into the hype of the quarterbacks, you read the mock drafts and you're like, okay, this is how it's going to go. And it didn't go the way I thought it was. I thought teams were going to reach, but I was really impressed. I'm going to, I just want to quickly get to your Detroit Lions for you guys that mm. don't know. My man Jackson is a big Detroit Lions fan. I want to first get your assessment of how they did in the draft. I thought their first round, they couldn't have done better. I thought they got the best player in Aiden Hutchinson, especially on the defensive end side. And then Jamison Williams in Alabama, that was when they traded up for it. I thought they were going quarterback, but they got probably the best receiver in this draft. Oh, a hundred percent. I was over the moon with our draft. And ever since MCDC Motor City, Dan Campbell got in there, we had Brad <laughs> Holmes get in there. They have started to change everything. I recently just talked about this on my channel, so I'll try and keep it more so brief. But what we're doing when we had Stafford, the draft was always the most depressing time of year because we literally, so I feel like it was like an underlying factor that we knew how good Stafford was. And so we tried to make a big instant impact home run, a big wide receiver to try and make him happy. But we were really just kind of building a mansion on sand foundation. There really wasn't any stability. And so we looked to last year's draft, get Penny Sewell, we get uh, Levi, we get uh, McNeil like we are building up the defensive line the offensive line top 10 in the league we go out and get Aiden Hutchinson I can't tell you how fast they probably ran up and put that pick in because he was to me he was not head and shoulders but he was definitely the best in the draft uh really fits the culture that Detroit's looking for and that's what kind of Detroit's new motto is is that they're just trying to you know build the offensive line build a defense steal receivers in the third round like an Amara St. Brown and that's kind of where I thought they were going but then not to sit on your hands when you're watching who in my opinion is the best receiver in the draft maybe they have the same but fall all the way to 12 they didn't sit on their hands they said hey we don't know how long this is going to like, we don't know how long our rebuild is going to be. My guess is it's going to be shorter than some people think, but they went up, they got him. And the only reason I think he was falling is because of his ACL already seen videos of him training, not worried about that at all. And then to go get Josh Pascal, who I had super underrated on the defensive line. And again, Aiden Hutchinson, Josh Pascal, both captains on their teams in college, they're building a culture and they are going to be biting kneecaps in Detroit. <laughs> Yeah, that's something that Dan Campbell, I think he caught a lot of people off guard initially with the whole kneecap stuff, but he might have just right. been really, he might have been really excited that day. So I'm going to give him a pass, but it the entire season. Oh, I'm so glad you're taking that off. Thank you. I oh, that was, put that here for now. We're good. You're going to use that for it's whenever. Uh, in the way. <laughs> I didn't bring I, out a broom out of respect because they I might respect. get one. They, mm -hmm. Oh, you're, we're going to, we're going <laughs> to ignore that. We're going to ignore that. But what Detroit did last year is they fought for their team. Usually if you're down, like they were down like 20 at one point, it felt like they were right in the game and ready to win the Super Bowl. It was crazy to see how Dan Campbell was able to transform the team. And it might not have shown up on the record. So you would, you'll probably watch this episode and see that Detroit only won, I believe, three games. You know, really? But you had to watch the games. You really had to be there. Um, and I think for, this was a really a trend across the draft. Really teams that struggled last year were making really solid choices the Jets, yes. the Giants, the Lions. I think the Giants with Kayvon Thibodeau and Evan Neal, that's going to be a really interesting conversation. The Texans, Derek Stingley, who I think everyone's got their ups and downs, polarizing player, but his best could be potentially shut down. And it's really exciting to see that teams that have notably struggled, at least while I'm watching football, are starting to really turn it around. Which usually isn't the case because usually like, when you see someone at the bottom, there's typically a reason. And when you look at a team like the Rams that we can kind of project in like a few years that are going to be bad because of all the push all in, have no picks, that type of stuff. But then they're still going to have good people leading the organization. Teams that have been bad consistently and have this revolving door of coaches and GMs and quarterbacks, there's a reason. And it usually stems from the draft when you have these cheap rookie deals. So to see teams come in, I mean, the Jets absolutely 
killed the first round. The Giants to go out and get two people that were projected number one overall within the last few months. Absolute steal. Again, we said the Lions. Texans might not be the biggest like shock value for everyone, like all of them, but I I think they got value at every single spot they picked at. So I'm really excited to see that. And as soon as like we see how stacked the AFC is, how stacked the NFC is. And now, I mean, we look at the Patriots, your division, the Jets. I mean, yeah. look at their roster. I mean, if they can put it together, that's all the thing. We can look on paper, but when it comes game time, like all these other factors come in. The Jets on paper really don't have that many holes offensively or defensively. And before they even killed the draft, they killed the off season too. getting offensive linemen, getting tight ends, wide receivers. It's, it's been awesome. And maybe yeah. still get Debo. Who knows? They might. It, it depends depending on what next rumor OBJ decides to drop because I almost had a heart attack. <laughs> I, let me tell you when I read that tweet, I was just like, <gasps> I was like, okay, it's happening. Everybody calm down. We're, we're getting the top receiver, but I think that, I've torn my ACL before. All you have is time. He is probably bored out of his gourd right now, just sending <laughs> tweets out there. I don't blame him at all. In the last week, he's selling a house and making NFL reporters go nuts on Twitter. But I think there's a couple things around the league that, and I'm going to use the words, the word seals, seal of approval. And I think the quarterbacks that got them were Zach Wilson. They're going to say, hey, we're going to build around you. Let's see what you can do. Because I thought Zach Wilson was honestly, and we, we talk about, my guy, Jackson, he's made videos on each rookie quarterback that had significant contributions last year. He's made a video on Davis, Davis Mills, Mac Jones, Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, whichever you want to look at. He's talked about them in depth, so we'll keep this one brief. But Zach Wilson, nice they plug. put the seal. Yeah, I got you. The seal of approval on him. I think Jared Goff's getting at least another year in Detroit. They've Especially by getting Jamison Williams a speed to receive for their building something there. Davis Mills, the seal of approval there. The Texans didn't go and reach for somebody. I think they, I don't, I did. I mentioned Daniel Jones. I think he's probably got one year of safety. Maybe we'll see. Well, yeah, they didn't take one, but I think the giants are kind of like in the same boat as the Lions right now, because they were both kind of rumored to take quarterbacks, but I'm really glad both of them didn't because we're seeing the volatility in the NFL right now. I mean, let's just think, I mean, off the top of our head right now, uh, Russell Wilson, Deshaun Watson, Matt Ryan, Man. Carson Ooh. Wentz. I mean, these, these, I mean, Carson Wentz kind of the outlier in that group right there, <laughs> but the, people are moving the year before uh, we have Matthew Stafford year before we have Brady. We have all these like top, top level quarterbacks going to teams to try and compete immediately. So either go that direction or go through the draft next year's quarterback draft is significantly better than this year. So I really like, and so if you give Daniel Jones or Derek Goff one more year, they're going to be fine. I don't think either of them have expectations to win the Super Bowl um, just with how everything's looking, but very smart decision because they get that pressure from their fan bases. But I think in the long run, they're really going to pay off with having a really good solid cast around them, having good offensive linemen. And then you plug in the quarterback either for the future or the veteran quarterback to win now, like the Broncos did. Yeah. The Broncos, who the Broncos are Russell sure. Wilson. I cannot, there's certain things that I just cannot wait for next fall. But like you mentioned with those quarterbacks, it's not really of, like I said, seal of approval, but it's more of a, let's see how it goes. And let's just wait and see, because we're not say, Hey, we're still in this rebuilding process. And I keep air quoting for like, just some reason, but <laughs> they're like with the lions, for example, you hate the Spotify listeners. <laughs> yeah, I guess I do, <laughs> but you could do like the lions could go seven and seven and 10, six and 11. It'd be considered a really significant improvement, especially if those especially if you go six and 11 and those three losses potentially are three game winning field goals and you could have been nine and eight and flipped the season behind. So there's a lot of cer different circumstances that I think teams are pre the, the, the atmosphere. Cause like Brady, Matthew Stafford, the Rams and the bucks, they went to the team and they won immediately. It was a, just a, a 12 month turnaround, which is insane. It's not going to happen with every team. So you have to really be realistic and be patient. I think the NFL I mean, look at the Bengals. Yeah. The NFL has kind of lost that patience and the Bengals are being patient. They got their guys, they're working it out and they got their, I think their, their biggest hole was offensive line. They're able to kind of fill that up and they really went for it in free agency in the draft. So it's really going to be, I mean, the AFC North next year is going to be a war. So we'll see, but it's really, a lot of teams are doing really good things and it's really nice to see because it creates parody. It creates excitement, especially for, across the league. There's no real, I get the sense next year there won't be real one. There'll be a bad, bad team, but each team is interesting. There's not one team I don't, there's not one I go, ooh, I don't really want to watch them.
Yeah, sure. no, I can. I completely agree. I was trying to uh, run through my head real quick if there's any teams I genuinely wouldn't want to watch. Um, yeah. Seattle might be a bit of a snooze fest next year, but besides that, I don't even really know. See, I mean, see, with Seattle, it's always interesting be just because of the personalities they have with like Jamal Adams and uh, DK Metcalf. Like, if I'm watching a game, like they're playing maybe Jacksonville, I'm like, oh, I'll sit, I'll watch this. I'll see a DK Moss somebody. I'll watch Jamal Adams be called Blitz Boy on Twitter. I'm, I'm all for it. <laughs> we'll see drew lock <laughs> drew lock right, okay. let's keep this positive let's keep this positive <laughs> there's a lot of teams to talk about i don't need to be taking a dump on drew lock <laughs> i love how you mentioned drew lock and then you just start laughing that's just any indication <laughs> well i i knew there there was this was not gonna go spinning in a very positive direction but again seattle not taking a quarterback i like what they're doing they were yeah. patient sticking to the plan positive seattle positive not gonna watch them too much next year though this podcast is going to be nothing but positive until we get to the Patriots. nothing but positivity <laughs> maybe for you maybe right. I, I, let's talk about them let's really let's okay. get into new england and how so i i wish you were there i really do i really do and we are back guys sorry for that little technical difficulty there but like i was saying i do wish you were there to see that cole strange freak out and i called you on the phone and yes. I was so, I wasn't happy. And there were a lot of choice words that were used that we won't put on this uh, here podcast, but I want to get your take. I want to get an outsider's perspective on what new England's done. I think they most, for the most part, they recovered. I think they stumbled early in the beginning because I do think Cole strange, despite what Belichick said would have been there probably in the second or third round for them to pick up. I do believe the initial thinking was that they wanted Zion Johnson out of Boston College, and then when the LA Chargers took him, they decided to trade back and get Cole Strange as their backup plan, which still blows my mind. But I want to get your perspective. I do like the picks like Tyquan Thornton. I liked the corner out of Houston. I thought it was – I thought they did a lot of good things, but they, they, they also are going to get a lot of attention for this first-round pick. So I did want to get your perspective on it and just what – especially you're going to be making videos on each team. So I wanted to see what are you thinking about New England because this was a pivotal year for them. They needed to make an improvement to be able to compete with Buffalo. And for the most part, I don't know if they've really done that. Sure. Um, yeah, and I'm actually looking more into it right now, kind of in the middle of processing everything. But it was the classic Bill Belichick first round pick comes up. And the one word you say is who? <laughs> like, <laughs> who? <laughs> Cole, uh-huh. Cole Strange? UT Chattanooga? What is going on? And I'm going to tell you why I don't mind this. Um, and I actually, so I guess hindsight will always be the best dictator, but to judge it post-draft is interesting to me because I, I see the draft in two different perspectives. One, you're building a team. Two, you're contending. You're a playoff team, which the Patriots fall in that category. Uh, so when it, when it's your pick and you want to go best available, so let's say the best available linebacker is on the board, but also there's the best tackle in the draft. You're going to go with the tackle. That's who, that's position value. That's who you need on your team. That's what you're going to do. When you get to a position like you're in New England, like you're the Chiefs, like you're Buffalo, you're going for need. And that's where I kind of see these picks coming in. Buffalo needed a running back, went out and got a running back. Uh, Chiefs needed some defensive end help. They got that. And so when you look at it from that perspective, if New England says, we want a guard, then they're going to get a guard and maybe. And so the one thing that's getting blown up right now, probably more because it was more comical and it came out later, Sean McVay felt really bad about what he said. And he wasn't criticizing Bill Belichick. He was criticizing his GM for being, why do we think he was going to be here? Then it came out later. Cole Strange was probably going to go early in a second. And maybe even if he goes late in the second, if the Patriots are thinking, okay, can we know for sure that he's going to be there by our next pick. If that's, if you need a guard and that's your guy, is he for sure going to be there by the next pick? If you 100% can't say yes, then go out and get him because I mean, you're counting on 31 potential other teams, having them not as high as you do. And if you have them this high, maybe one other team, it, all it takes is one other team for you to not get him. So I don't mind getting Cole strange this early. If they didn't think for sure they could get him by the next time. And then the same thing goes for wide receiver. Did they get the best available wide receiver? In my opinion? No, but what do they need? They need speed. They're very lacking in speed. 
And then once you're a contending team, you can start looking at it through this perspective. Okay, we need the fastest wide receiver. Is he going to be there by the next pick? I don't know. Go out and grab him. Now, hindsight will tell us is Sky Moore end up being better. And uh, this is where we kind of look at like, oh, you should have gotten this guy. But what New England needs right now to be a better overall football team, they need to replace uh, uh, the offensive line spot. And they need someone that can stretch out the defense because they have two very good tight ends. And when you have a speedy slot receiver, that puts a lot of pressure on safeties and linebackers, which puts even more pressure on them co- trying to cover the tight ends, which only opens up the run game so I don't mind New England's draft picks criticizing of course we can come back hindsight and say okay a guard that got taken after uh, Cole Strange ended up being much better then we might be able to criticize that but there's a difference between a bad draft pick and reaching in my opinion so this is why I don't mind uh, have to dig in more whether I think it's bad or not because there were I mean this was the fastest 40 at the wide receiver position I've ever seen there's a lot of speedsters but I don't think this is necessarily with uh, Taekwon Thornton I don't necessarily think this is a track guy from what I've seen from him so far he can run routes he catches contested balls so that's a proven that that can be a good I don't think they're thinking they got the next Tyreek Hill but what they're doing from an offensive scheme perspective I think is going to really work out for New England yeah and the thing that I was trying to like be in the because in the moment it's very easy for and you you could obviously you obviously saw it with me is (laughs) the overreaction or just the anger because I you get your mindset on certain players and then when that doesn't happen and even more so when it's someone you have no idea who they are you tend to just lean towards the negative side of things. So I can, I really appreciate that perspective because I was, I'm really, all I've seen in the media is that new England has had their worst draft in years. And I'm like, okay, let's, let's calm down because really close what new England, I think is trying to do there in those first two picks is a, you had a whole guard. And at the beginning of the season, when Mac Jones was developing, the line was shuffling around, around like crazy. He was getting hit. And they were still able to contend in games. They're saying, hey, maybe if we start with a solidified offensive line, we never know. And then you have Tyquan Thornton, because all of really New England's receivers, like Kendrick Bourne isn't really, he's a speedy guy, but he's not like a Tyquan Thornton where we can run a 4-2 and say, hey, Kendrick, we need you to go run a streak down the field and draw the safety here. So right. maybe Hunter Henry on a drag route can get opened up, or maybe we can do a screen here. So they're able to do different things now. So I think Belichick and their thinking was, hey, how can we, it helped Mac Jones out. And especially with that deep ball accuracy, especially without Al- at Alabama, if that can be a connection, I'm not saying it'll be like a Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase type thing, or even Patrick Mahomes, Tyreek Hill, but even if it could be somewhat like that, I think it could be dangerous. So uh, there's a lot of positives and there's also a lot of, let's just wait and see. I know. I completely agree. And I absolutely love, it's like, okay, how do you help out a young quarterback? Mac Jones, they found, okay, this is our guy shows a lot of potential, a lot of talent incredible i think he's their future how do you help him out offensive line wide receiver love that for mac jones um and uh oh wait where was i going with that i'm so sorry because I, I got the whole i have bailey zap there's zappy zap oh. in, in the back of my head now <laughs> but yeah I, oh exactly so with bill belichick i think narrative dictates the media more often than it should and i think a big narrative on belichick and you can correct me if i'm wrong is that he likes to do things to show off so it's like hey i'm gonna go take this d3 guy and win a super bowl with him like i think people in the media take that perspective more so than bill belichick eats breathes sleeps bleeds football and he's gonna do whatever it takes to win and he's gonna go so far into digging into these prospects that people might not be able to. I do not think taking Cole Strange was like, hey, look what I can do with this Hickerbilly with a face mask with a line down the middle. I don't think that's his goal at all. I think he's saying, okay, I did the work. Maybe he thinks Cole Strange could have been the first guard taken off the board or the best lineman overall in the draft. So I think that perspective of Bill Belichick, if that was the narrative that this guy's obsessed with winning, he's going to go through every length to look at every prospect. But I think people are like, oh, he wants to show off. So this is why he did it. And then people start to judge it. Okay. I like the perspective. And I think that's kind of a, I lean towards more of the, he just does his homework so much that it's like not many people think yeah, that, and the Duggar pick has worked out very well. Duggar's been right. a really solid contributor these last couple of years. So to wrap up, I want to ask you, I want to get a winner that you, like a defined winner and, de- and a defined loser. We're going to go one way or the other for both of them. And I just want to kind of see what you think. 
which team really stood out to you in a good way and which team really stood out to you in a bad way and a negative and a positive. You don't have to be too negative because I know we've been kind of nice on this a little podcast here, but uh, I do want to hear your thoughts. Okay, I'm going to get a little bit negative for some teams, but okay. <laughs> I have two teams. Um, so the overall winners, I would say, of the entire offseason so far is the Jets. Um, and I know this probably might be – uh, okay, so I won't – we won't talk about them. I'll talk about the Jets specifically. Uh, Giants had a great draft. Lions had a great draft. Also, the Ravens going with best available, getting Kyle Hamilton and uh, Linderbaum – amazing first round later picks really good too uh but i think the jets overall having two top 10 picks is a really good place to be in but then again like the lions did with jameson williams not sit on your heels you see this guy they had jermaine johnson top eight on their big board to see him slip all the way down and say okay two's not enough we'll trade up we'll be aggressive get three first rounders go out and get your guy what they're doing to build around zach wilson they're building the offensive line getting him weapons helping him out on defense bob Sala comes from a winning culture so that's what i really like from that as well so that is my big winner of the day do you want to give your winner do you want me to go to my losers i'm going to say my winner of the day is is going to probably be the jets as well i really agree with what you're saying and it pains me as a division rival because I've grown up with the Jets being a staple of what bad football looks like. But what they've done this offseason has been really, and like you said, it's what Sala has done as a coach, establishing culture. The really teams that I've grown up with that are have been terrible are going to be really good in these next couple of years. I think if Zach Wilson is truly the guy, this Jets team in this division as a whole, with the Dolphins, if Tua stays and improves and stays the quarterback that he is, that's a roster that he doesn't have to be spectacular on, especially with Tyreek Hill. Buffalo's amazing. Josh Allen's amazing. With Belichick, New England can always compete. If the Jets are that fourth team, it could be a war zone in the AFC East. So I think the Jets have done phenomenally for themselves. And it's saying, All hey, young Zach, quarterbacks. Yeah. Said, hey, we're giving you the pieces. Let's see what you do with it. And I'm going to go ahead and go with my loser. I'm not going to go with New England. I'm going to, I'm going to go. This is like, <laughs> this is a really, I don't really like. And this is going to be, you're going to probably not like the, like these. Uh, I did not like what the Packers did. I did not. I think that the, the Packers, what I really wish they, and I think I love the only pick that I really appreciated from them was this Christian Watson pick, but I saw a bunch of teams in the first round. I saw a bunch of teams be really aggressive with this, these receivers. This was the class. If the Green Bay was going to do it, they just got off this Aaron Rodgers pissed off train where they finally, they, they, went through it was basically going through the titanic they sunk so many times and they were somehow able to get out of it and got aaron Rodgers committed long term and this year with Devonte adams gone i thought they could have done better with receiver i like quay walker and Devonte wyatt i just wish they could have been a little more aggressive in the first round and that's why they're not necessarily a loser and that are going to stink next year but i think they could have there was an opportunity there and they did not take it yeah. So with that, so you're saying you wish they would have traded up because I don't I do. think they should have gone. Away. Okay. That being said, so who did Detroit trade with at 12 Minnesota, right? Yeah. Minnesota's not going to trade with green Bay to give Aaron Rodgers Jamison Williams. I'm telling well, yeah. you that right now, that's where they're at a disadvantage. This is why the Niners aren't talking to them with Debo Samuel. They were definitely in on that trade. He, they wanted DK Metcalf. They wanted Tyler Lockett. I don't think they could throw enough at them to be like, oh yeah, here, Aaron Rodgers, here's a perennial pro bowler. Like they're not going to do that. So I think that's where green Bay's at a disadvantage. I think they were trying to trade up. I wouldn't be surprised if that came out that they were offering one, if not both of their first round picks to try and get a receiver. But also I really like the Christian Watson pick. Uh, so I think what, and so if, if yeah, I agree with you. If green Bay was able to be able to trade up. Okay. Personally, I don't think that's the case because especially any NFC team, because who took receivers, the Saints, NFC, the Vikings, the Falcons are yeah, the Falcons yeah, took at, Drake London. Yeah, the Falcons. Um, and so the Jets, they were gonna get Garrett Wilson. So all the people that took receivers in front of them, and once those guys were gone, there's really isn't anyone worth up trading up with. So unless the Packers threw both their first, a second, and I don't think it was gonna happen. So that's that's just my perspective. I could be completely wrong though. Right. It, it would well, that's why like it did surprise me to see a division, even like there's no disrespect to like Detroit here, but like seeing Minnesota trade away with Detroit, I was like, if they can get I, I know Minnesota's last thing on their mind and i think you bring up a good point the last thing on their mind they want to do is trade to a division rival that has been dominating the division for years 
but a team maybe like the Saints where it's kind of neutral where there's not much like this I know it's the same conference but maybe Green Bay at least I, w- I would love to have heard them making it but I think at si- it. the Saints needed a lot of it yeah they did I, I liked what they did too with the with getting Jameis I, Winston a, a solid piece Saints are one of my losers really one okay I do want to hear this I want to hear this let's let's see what so, you got man Olave incredible pick he was my wide receiver too i had him over wilson over drake london a lot of it was my wide receiver too um the trevor penning pick if oh, you we did if talk you, about this yep if you gave me a seventh round draft pick and it's the last pick of the round or of the entire draft and there's trevor penning on the board top tackle prospect and there's matt ariza punter out of sdsu i'm taking matt ariza every time you could not get me to draft this guy. There are so many things I dislike about them. So that's why the Saints aren't my biggest loser. They're my they're they're considered because they had such a great pick and then in my opinion a terrible pick in Trevor Penning. So you but think they kind of split is what you're saying? They're, they're kind of split. Um especially they're definitely the biggest loser out of teams that had two picks in the first round for sure. Okay. Yeah, and opinion. I think I saw the clip of Trevor Penning the tech, I think, and I don't know, it was the senior bowl practice and like, he nearly just like decapitated Desmond Ritter and on, like he threw the lineman into him and everyone was like, dude, what are you doing? So working, it's just everything. When I looked more at, so I saw it, it's like character things playing after the whistle. It's so 15 yard penalties are so hard to overcome. And he gives you a lot of them. He gives you a lot of holding penalties and working with a football team, working with the de- uh, defensive ends, everything is so technical. Like besides quarterback, I think it's more technical than DB wide receiver, because if you put your hand here or here or here, it makes a huge difference. And I think he has none of that. I get he's big and strong, but I think he goes out there with the mentality that they're trying to dominate you. Like, no, as an offensive lineman, you have to have finesse. You have to have perfect technique because these are trained people. And he played a super small school against bad talent. And as soon as they started to win the rep, choke hold them, bring them to the ground and then lay on them and be like, yeah, F you, man. Like that's his mindset. I don't know if you can fix that because football is a super uber competitive sport. So no matter how much training you get, if he lines up for the saints and uh, Shaq Barrett is going against them twice a year and he's working him, expect personal fouls, expect holding calls. He's going to get frustrated. I don't think you can fix that mindset. And I think he's not going to be the, re- especially getting rid of Teron or Teron at Armstead. That yeah. is not the replacement I would want, but that, sorry, that was a long rant for not being my loser, <laughs> but <laughs> I would say the Washington commanders were the biggest, oh, loser. the new team. The new, the new team, name. the commies, they came out there and bombed their first draft, uh, in indeed. my opinion. So they were sitting at they were sitting at 11. And this is where you can kind of look at things because hindsight is always um, the best because let's say uh, the 49ers give all these picks to get Trey Lance. Okay, we're not going to know in years and years to come who won that trade. We're not going to know how good Trey Lance is. We're not going to know what those picks turn into. When you're trading up and down in the draft, you can get not – a complete idea, but a better idea of the immediate value you got for what you got with the picks. So commanders sitting in 11, they want a wide receiver. They pass up on what I believe to be the second best receiver in the draft in Olave, hand him to the saints, go back to 16, get Jahan Dotson, which to me, he's good. I don't think he did anything elite. He wasn't a first round talent. In my opinion, I think that might've been a reach. I know they wanted a receiver, but they also got two extra picks with that. Yeah. So they moved from 11 to 16. They got two extra picks. That sounds awesome, right? On paper. But then we can look at who did those picks turn into? Brian Robinson running back out of Alabama. Uh, sure. Great running back. You already have Antonio Gibson. It's a running back uh, to me. Uh, and then two, their second pick, Sam Howell. Yeah. So, so To me, the difference between Olave, Jahan Dotson, Brian Robinson, and Sam Howell, that package deal was a complete flop for me. I don't think they should have traded back. I think they should have stayed in there. Hindsight might tell us otherwise, but as of right now, I don't think running back was a huge need for this team. A backup quarterback to Carson Wentz that I don't think either of them. I mean, Carson Wentz, we'll see. Sam Howell, I have a lot of problems with. 
Uh, if he turns into something, I could be very wrong. What I saw, he doesn't look like he's going to be ready. So a backup quarterback and a backup running back to go from the second best receiver in the draft to what I don't even see as a first round talent. They are my biggest losers of the first round. Interesting stuff. Well, today, man, today has been so much fun. We talked a lot. We covered a lot of ground too. Very, 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 very much flowed. Always Probably a, a lot, a lot too much Lions talk than people are comfortable with. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you talk a little bit about Lions, some people might be a little uncomfortable, but uh, we got a, uh-oh, uh-oh. What? I thought you were bringing like a jersey or something that you're whipping. Oh, we are out. for the outro. We have to let uh, everyone know. Uh, I knew it was coming. So, <laughs> guys, thank you so much for listening. And if you've listened all the way through here, you saw the Antetokounmpo jersey yet again. And I probably botched that pronunciation. But, guys, this was episode 83. JEM Live joins us yet again to talk some NFL draft. Buddy, guys, go subscribe to his channel. He is on, he is a rising star, like I mentioned in the beginning of this video in the NFL YouTube community. Guy is making an absolute set of videos they're bangers i cannot wait to see what he does next guys if you're subscribed or haven't subscribed yet sub- spread the word for this podcast subscribe for more content subscribe to my guy jackson's channel have a fantastic week and take care